from Hollywood, California, the horror capital of the world, the Boulay Brothers, Creatures of the Night. Hello, my little uglings, and welcome to a new episode of Creatures, Creatures of, of the Night. <laughs> As always, we are your Queens of Darkness, the Boulay Brothers, Drac Morda, and Swan Thula. And we are coming to you from Tucson, Arizona tonight. Ooh. We are still on the road with the cast of the Boulay Brothers Dragula Season 5 tour. Swan, do we have any updates from the tour? Any cast secrets or BTS bits our listeners might find entertaining? Yes, I definitely want to share something because I have decided that we have the best fans any Queen of Darkness could ask for. And I thought that myself, but I said, let me talk to the crew. Let me ask them because we're not the only tour that they crew for. They tour with a lot of other queens and musical acts and stuff, so they get to see various shows from different vantage points. And I said, hey, what, if anything, makes a Dragula tour or a Dragula fan base stand out? And it was kind of instant because the first thing that they said was, oh, they're nice. Like, your fans are nice and they're respectful. Which I'm like, okay, what is happening at other meet and greets? Do you know what I mean? But I asked the photographer, Gabriel, and he said in Trixie and Katya, people will buy a meet and greet and come up and insult them. (laughs) Read them. And I'm like, (laughs) what? (laughs) You know, something else he said was that the fans are just super charged about being there. And, and, And the last thing is they dress up, right? Like the fans dress up. It's like a party. It's like a weird Adams Family, Boulay Brothers, like family gathering. It's awesome. So you don't have any tea from the competitors or anything? From the competitors? No, do you? Do you? Anything happened backstage or anything? I don't, I don't. Nothing dramatic has happened. No. Orgotic it, shaved down the middle of his head. Yes. That was pretty wild. Neo proves to be a <laughs> diva and a goddess anywhere and everywhere we go. Whether it's the beaches of Florida to the mall in, in Tucson, she looks like the queen of the Can underworld. Can I just say, Neo is so hot. She is fucking cool. She is so cool looking, like no matter where we take her, and she has been through the desert. I mean, just some funny things. I'll say this is this is some funny things I remember. I just would not picture Orgotic and Neo Hulu going to some of the places that the crew is taking them, okay? And what I mean is they took them to cookout in North Carolina, which is a total redneck watering hole in the middle of the night, which I, I don't I don't know how that was. went OK. Yeah. Took them to Walmart, like picturing the two of them shopping in Walmart. Oh, totally. <laughs> I wonder what they were like. Or God, it was be like, what? Is this place? No, my favorite is they went to Texas Roadhouse and they lied and said it was Orc's birthday. So they brought a like a, a rodeo saddle out and a cowboy hat and, you know, jigged around him and sang <laughs> happy birthday, which, oh, I wish I was there. I love it. I love it. But yeah, I mean, honestly, everyone's been very well behaved. I love this cast and I love the crew. Everyone's professional. Nobody really complains and they do great shows every night. So yeah. I'm thankful for them. No, me too. I'm also thankful that you and I got to escape to New Orleans unexpectedly while we were traveling through that section of the country. And it was cool because we hadn't been there since we were filming Resurrection during the pandemic. And it was kind of like a little bit of a flashback moment to that. And uh, it just made me think about that whole experience and how crazy it was. Yeah, filming Resurrection was like something I'll never forget. But New Orleans has such a special place for both of us. Yeah, it was really nice to be back there and just be around the energy of that city. It's so unique and it just takes you to a place that's like you're reading a book. You're living in a book. Absolutely. I love it too. The great food. And we came home with tons of vampire artifacts and paraphernalia. (laughs) Lots of swag from New Orleans on this trip. Well, we found some haunted kind of antique stores and procured some really interesting items that I might have to share on TikTok another time. Other news that I think is pertinent to this episode is... The news about the shark attacks in Florida. Yeah. What do you think about that? I think it's uncanny because we were just there swimming in the ocean. We were were just there. Okay, the whole cast and crew were on the beach in the ocean for a long time in Florida the day before the the shark attacks happened. 
we made that happen. <laughs> I think we did. Yeah, I, well, I we made believe the next day I was laughing so hard because they would be terrified because I was joking oh with them about God. sharks, you know. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then that happened. But, you know, I guess you shouldn't really be surprised, right? That's the shark's home. It's just scary to see how close they come up onto the shore. Right? Oh, yeah, I, people, I think a lot of people believe like, oh, you're in up to your knees or up to your waist. And I we saw a shark on the footage come right up almost out of the water onto the beach. It's so after scary. somebody. So yeah. scary. Yeah. So we brought the sharks to Florida and now we brought the this hellacious heat wave to the southwest where we're entering now. I'm like, hi, as soon as we get here, it's like 104 degrees. Yeah. Well, you know, the bus has to break down at least once every tour, right? <laughs> well, it already has. Maybe it'll be twice on this one if we're lucky. Well, at least we got a superior upgraded bus. I know. Yeah. So anyways, the shark attack kind of leads into our Junior Mints movie club review this episode. So why don't we take a quick break and when we come back, we will get right to our Junior Mints movie club movie review. Stay tuned, uglies. Welcome back, my little sea hags. It's now time for our Junior Mints Movie Club Movie Review. And today we are talking about Under Paris. From French director Xavier Jens, Under Paris has made its streaming debut on Netflix and is currently ranking the number two movie spot on the platform. So once I saw that, I was like, maybe it's worth checking out. To save Paris from a bloodbath, a grieving scientist is forced to face her tragic past when a giant shark appears in the Seine. Now, before we dive into the murky waters below Paris and discuss, just what was your takeaway? Like, as the credits were rolling, how did you feel after the movie was over? I felt very satisfied. It was I fun. I felt very satisfied. I was happy that it wasn't a happy, cleaned up ending. Me the ending too. was horrible. It, no, was it was a great. horror movie. I was so happy and pleased and just satisfied as a as a viewer at the end. Like the sharks ate and I felt like I ate too. By the end, I was full. I think in terms of it being a horror movie, it delivered. It gave you everything you wanted and deserved. Um, no, I totally agree. And before we go any further, I do want to say that there are going to be spoilers. So do with that what you will. And let's just start off by saying like the premise of the movie is a little wonky. Now that it I, is that's not my my big bone to pick with it. So this lady goes out with her team and they're diving and they're trying to do something with the shark. There's a, you know, the shark there. I don't know why they're trying to track it, but they're trying to get a sample from it or whatever. There were several. Yeah. Yeah. But there was one in particular they were after. And it, when they find it, it's gotten like much bigger than they thought it was supposed to. And then it kills all of them, basically, except for her. She escapes. Yeah. The, her, the rest of her team gets killed. And then a couple years later, she's back in France <laughs> and somehow <Yeah. laughs> this shark goes all the way from what looked like, I don't know, over by Los Angeles and swam all the way across the oceans of the earth to Paris. And then somehow also got into the rivers around there. Did I miss something? Because I don't think there was an explanation. I'm like, wait a minute. There wasn't. It was giving like Jaws two or three, like whatever the one where that's personal. Yeah. Like when Jaws like chases this woman around the planet. I'm like, is that what's happening? There was no reasoning. There was no explanation. And I thought they were going to get to it, but they never did. And I think at that point I was kind of like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know if I can get into this movie or if this is going to go <laughs> the way I want it to go. But it does end up, it, it turns the corner and it, it ends up being really fun. Another piece of the puzzle that I felt was like a little bit of a strange fit was we learned that this is a new breed of shark. Like they initially thought this test subject number seven, who they call Lilith, Lilith is the big shark kind of like um, antagonist, is thought to be a mako shark. But then they're like, because of environmental reasons and behavioral changes in the sea life, we're kind of evolving and this is becoming like a new breed of shark very aggressive and has the unique ability to produce asexually, which is called parthenogenesis. And yes, I had to stop and Google and I'm like, okay, this is an animal that can give birth without having to mate. It's like what drag queens do when they have a drag daughter. 
<laughs> it just happens. It just happens, exactly. And, you know, like in this movie, they can have a bunch of them. There could be 20 in there. Yeah. And then there's the weird time jump that Drac mentioned, and we're we're back in Paris. Sophia is the doctor, who's the main character. And, yeah, and there's the shark. Lilith's tracker has been reactivated, and basically she's, like, right there. I mean... The, in the, the city. The woman is on the shores of the, of the river, and she's just, like, <laughs> pointing in. It's like, there it is. There's a fin. It's so I mean, stupid. It's so bad what you're describing. <laughs> Yeah. It is bad. It is bad. But well, it didn't feel bad when we were watching it. You're like, huh? But it, it just gets fun. <laughs> so you don't care. I think that's the thing. Because when you see a shark movie, you're, you assume that it's not going to be gratuitous because it seems like the effects would be hard to do. Yeah. But they went there. No, they this totally shark went there would jump up in the air and just inhale somebody. And it was amazing. Chopping people in half left and right. And not just like one person, like 50 people. My like two a favorite. Bath. Mo- okay. So I don't know if we need to walk, maybe we need to walk them through it a little bit. So she decides, wait a minute, before I go there, enter this hot Harbor patrol guy. Oh now, my God. For, I don't know what, Men.com website they found this guy in, but it was very distracting. I don't even remember his name and I don't care (laughs) because he was hot to the point of distraction. Like I I found it hard to concentrate on the movie. I thought the same thing. I was like, get off of the screen. I need to look at the shark right now. Shark snack. (laughs) Oh my God. So yeah, there was this hot Harbor patrol guy and his team of people and they team up with Sophia enlist her help to try to deal with this shark. Because of course there is a giant triathlon triathlon swimming thing that's going to happen in the sin which is all the water around Paris. And so all these people are going to get in there and swim. And of course a shark shows up right then. And I really could relate to that mayor in that moment. (laughs) I really did. It it reminded me of production when she was like, I fucking spent so much time getting this together. I have spent thousands and millions of dollars to make this happen. Get rid of the fucking shark. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, I've been there. (laughs) Yeah. And her complete disregard from human life. Also relatable. (laughs) So she's like, you got to get the shark out of here. So she sends the Harbor Patrol people and the police and, you know, Sophia to deal with the shark. But it just gets crazier from there. Well, they soon discover that Lilith has given birth under the catacombs of Paris, which which led to a really cool moment because you see pillars made of human skulls and bones on the ground. And it brought me right back to when we toured in Paris and we went into the catacombs because that was really awesome unique and cool it really was and they said when we went on that tour that there were many places in paris outside of that where there was other catacombs and that they were underwater and everything so yeah. i thought that was a brilliant touch it was very cool so lilith has given birth to like i don't i don't know what a, a pack of sharks is called but we'll just call it a pack a, a, a giant horde of shark babies that are just hungry and terrorizing the, the rivers around Paris. And they're growing fast. So yeah. these things are growing into full size sharks in like, I don't know what, two weeks or something. I mean, it wasn't a lot of time that passed. Yeah. I think that the movie asks a lot of our suspension of disbelief, but trust us when we tell you, if you can just kind of turn that part of your brain off, it's like a really fun ride. Fun ride is a great phrase to describe it. So my favorite part of the movie was, Usually with movies like this, there's a threat, Mm -hmm. but the heroes, you know, save the day and take out Freddy or whatever. And then all the people escape. That did not happen in this movie. It felt like it was going to, though. They were like, let's get a plan. Set your watches. They're, we're going to detonate the, the gates under the city and just lure her out with this, like, beacon. Like, for a while, I, I mean, I just let it go. I was like, I don't know what the fuck. But it, what are they talking about? But the, this is the plan. Oh, they're going to, like, sew it up with and put a nice little bow on it. Not. But it goes to hell, and it keeps going deeper and deeper, and it was glorious. So they start blowing. They were trying to blow up the catacombs and trap the sharks in there. So they blow the thing up, but they somehow blow themselves up too. And right about this time, all the swimmers, you know, the, the triathlons happening. So all the swimmers are in the water. (laughs) And so the mayor's like, yay, I'm so happy. I was able to make this happen. And then Lilith breaks out of the rubble. Yeah. And 
and someone basically spot- starts eating everybody. Yeah, someone spots the fan and they scream shark. And then like the, the the SWAT team, the whole security force is like activated. They're firing machine gun fire into the water. And I was like, oh my God, look at all those swimmers. Is this going to be a bloodbath? I want a bloodbath. I want a bloodbath. It blood absolutely bath. was. Oh, it was so awesome. It was so this sounds sick, but it was so amazing to watch that the shark got to because you you thought for sure there's no way yeah. that the shark's going to get they're going to let the shark get to these triathletes. But they did. <laughs> and it was just eating people left and right. It was amazing that the mayor ends up in the water like everyone's like fighting. It was really realistic to think it of that, like that, that crazed energy of like trying to get out of there like a mosh pit or like, you know, like a rush to to the door of like a club to get out or something. Those are my two favorite moments. The first one was when one of the younger scientists had got on TikTok and was like, everybody come down here and help me lure this shark out because she wanted to get it back out to the ocean so they didn't kill it. So all these like stupid TikTok kids went down in there (laughs) and they start falling in the water and getting killed. That was the first (laughs) bloodbath. No, and I loved that scene. It was like that cylindrical room. It was terrifying. It was very cool. Because there was only one way out and that's what would happen for real. Like people start getting trampled and kicked in the head and they start falling in the water. There was a bunch of sharks there. They were eating all of them. People's arms and legs getting ripped off. I mean, it was gruesome. There was something about what they were able to achieve with the quality of the light under the water. Like it was both beautiful and scary as hell, yeah. like very menacing. Like some of the opening scenes, it was like the crystal blue water of the North Pacific. I'm like, wow, this is gorgeous. But then some of the scenes in the murky water under Paris, when they have like a red flare and you just like can see the underbelly of all of Lilith's babies. Like that was hot. It was, it was because what also revealed how many sharks were down there, which I can attest to this, that when you do shark dive and you shine a light down, there's like a thousand sharks. So that was very realistic when they did that. It, that's how it is. Crazy. So that, so that was the first thing I really liked about it. the second scene that I thought was equally as terrifying was when they were trying to run away from the dock where, you know, the triathletes were getting eaten up. And then the same thing happened. People started falling in the water. The military started shooting at the shark, which then hit all those deactivated old bombs and mines from World War II, I'm assuming, that were just sitting around in the water, they start blowing up, and it basically blows up all the bridges and levees and everything, and then all of a sudden Paris is totally submerged underwater. Paris is underwater, and the the, the scene that they leave us with is Sophia and Hot Guy stranded on some like metal raft thing, and there are just fins all over the water. It's terrifying and it was such a satisfying ending to a shark movie oh it so was and the pace was great like once it got going it was a roller coaster ride to the end i hope they make part two <gasps> it's set up for part two you think i do i, I mean, do it's, it's it's doing well on netflix maybe they'll do it we shall see Anyways, if you haven't seen Under Paris, definitely go watch it because we highly recommend it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It was a great thrill ride through the catacombs of Paris. And on that note, we are going to take our second break. And when we come back, we will be reaching into our bag of listener mail. Don't move. Welcome back, darlings. It's time we insert our manor key into the post box and dig out our listener questions from beyond the grave. <laughs> Lee from Dallas asks, I've gone to every Dragula show and just saw you in Dallas. Your masks number might be my favorite boule performance ever. My question relates to the Pride episode and Drax's comment on not seeing y'all on future tours. Does that mean we might not have Dragula tours again or that you gals might not be on those tours? <laughs> well, we can split this question because I just want to talk about the comment because the Halloween mask show is cute. It, it is. is cute. It's fun. And it, it, it puts a light on us in a way that I don't think audiences have necessarily seen before. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really happy that that the audiences are, are liking it. Oh, we can be 
very dumb and very camp. <laughs> and we do it very well. <laughs> It's funny because people only know us as how we present on the show where we're very serious and we're yeah. judging. But you think about the show. I mean, we have done hey, ridiculous It was almost drag, years. filth, horror, glamour, and stupid. Yeah. We just got the stupid part. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question about touring, look, I don't know exactly what I meant because I could see a future where the Dragula competitors tour without us. I could see a future where we tour by ourselves and the Dragula people tour by, you know, like separately. Sure. And I could see a world where we don't have time to go on tour for two months. I could see that as a possibility too. I love touring because meeting the fans reminds me that Dragula is a family and that all the positive energy is why we do it. But it is exhausting and very time consuming. It is exhausting, but I just want to reassure you, Lee, that I'm the keeper of the keys of touring and I'll make sure that it happens again. (sighs) (laughs) Kate asks, after seeing my first Dragula tour show and how much hard work goes into it, I was wondering, would you rather snap your fingers and instantly get into full drag, including cleanup? Or yes. snap your fingers and instantly set up for the show, including cleanup. Oh, that's so easy. I said it the first time. Snap your finger, magic twirl, Wonder Woman style, and you're in full drag. The joke about this is, what was it, two nights ago when I came up into the dressing room and I did the Wonder Woman spin and the explosion sound, <laughs> and I wanted so badly to, to turn to the mirror and to be in my full drag. Yeah, it, it didn't work. I think, of course, it would definitely be to snap our fingers and be in drag, because as far as the setup and all that stuff, once we're on the road, we're not pushing cases and stuff into the, the venue every night, so... You know, that's for the crew, really. So I'm not going to make their life easier and make mine harder. <laughs> Much as I love them, love you guys, but no. Yeah, it's the same thing when we film, too, because we do all of our own makeup. And it, it really tacks on an extra two to three hours of everything. So if you are if you have a 12-hour shooting day, it's 15 hours for the boulets. If you're on tour and we're doing the podcast and stuff instead of a five-hour show, it's kind of like an eight-hour commitment. It, 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 really, it really is. Yeah, so if I could spin like Wonder Woman and get in and out of drag. I would never complain. I would do every tour, every appearance, every, everything you would be sick of seeing me. Oh my God. And could you imagine if your eyebrows just went away while you spun? And then when you spun out to go back to your normal self, great. That'd be incredible. Be great. Cassie asks, my question is why did you two stop the mini scenes in each episode? They were so entertaining and I love seeing more of y'all acting in the episodes. So the answer to that is we wanted to take the intros in a new direction for the quote second chapter of Dragula. So remember we said, you know, seasons one through four were sort of like chapter one and starting with season five, it was chapter two. We wanted to move ourselves more into the horror host lane because we're the hosts of the show and sort of pay homage to horror hosts before us, Vampira, the Crypt Keeper, Elvira. There's so many. Yeah. And I think it just sort of, cemented our place there also as the show's gotten bigger and the production's gotten bigger the budget and the timing and the restraints of everything makes it very difficult to shift from shooting a reality show to then going into production on a scripted show which is basically what you have to do to do that and i think we decided that we would rather save those ideas and that content for our own shorts and movies So that's where you will see that stuff of us again. Yeah. And my thoughts on it are this. It's an evolution. We change up what we find inspiration in from season to season. You've seen the floor shows change. You've seen the intros change. The rooms that everyone performs in changes and our roles have changed and they may change again. But right now I feel very comfortable like where we're at and sort of guiding the audience on a tour of our version of a horror world. I agree with that. All right. Well, that's all the time we have this week, Uglies. Please remember to rate, subscribe, and review, especially on Apple Podcasts, after listening to every episode. And be sure to send us your listener questions to creatures at Boulay Brothers Dragula 
Dot.com. Also, a reminder, if you have not gotten tickets yet to the Blade Brothers Dragula live show, we are going to be in Phoenix this week, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. So if you're from one of those areas and you want to see the show, get your tickets while you still can. It's so good. The Boulay Brothers Creatures of the Night is hosted and produced by Drac Morta and Swanthula Boulay, along with co-host Ian DeVogler with music by Neuron Spectre.